Welcome to the Cloud 2030 Summit. Uh, this is part of a half-day event where we talk about a number of issues. In this case, we dove straight into the topic of the day, which was security, and how do we secure infrastructure? Can we secure infrastructure for the future? Uh, and this was in light of the SolarWinds hack, which had just happened. So. Um, very important topic that sort of grounded out everything else we talked about through the day. This is just the first of six sessions where we talk about uh, coming events and, and how technology is shaping the future and vice versa. Hope you enjoy it. Uh, The2030.cloud. Uh, this is part of ongoing conversations for us, so enjoy this session. It's a good kickoff. Fundamentally, uh, in security, are digital systems securable? And if they're not, if, if you're crazy enough to answer yes, I, okay, I want to hear why. But if, if, if you're answering no, um, how do we live with that? What's the consequences of, of where things are going from that perspective? And, so just, and I, oh, I'm Paul Teich. Um, did an intro, but I'm a big fan of complex systems. And so um, I'll, I'll just start the security um, discussion with, uh, we, we live in a world of complex interconnected digital systems. And so the interfaces are points of exposure. Um, and the more interfaces you have, the more points of exposure you have. Um, and so to me, Security becomes a discussion of uh, access, authority, uh, and the fact you can't test a complete system um, ever again. There you, I mean, because there are so many participants in each system, uh, I'm going to lob a grenade and say uh, the one clear use <laughs> that I've seen for blockchain is systems where nobody trusts each other. Um, if, there's, if there's a possibility of a central trust in, in a system, then you don't need blockchain. But going forward, you know, I was a blockchain doubter, um, still am to some degree, but um, in a complex system, there has to be kind of this chain of attestation. You have to be able to go back and figure out who did what, when to, track what's going on and to unravel it forensically. Um, I don't know if that means the end of anonymity at some point, um, because the other thing I'll get to later is um, I'm, not, I'm not a real big fan of the expression internet of things. Um, I like thinking about smart infrastructure and the fact that everything will eventually have microphones and cameras and thermal sensors and you'll be surrounded by non-privacy, <laughs> okay? There's nowhere you can go on the spaceship where your conversation is not being recorded, okay? <laughs> so, um, so for security and for privacy, um, in a complex system where there are different participants writing, coding different parts of the system and you've, you're dependent on APIs, um, I think total security is probably nightmarishly unrealistic. We're always going to have holes that can be exploited. I'll stop there. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll add to, to the, the blockchain uh, aspect since I, I work in that field. Um, part of the issue with blockchain is that um, Yes, there is decentralization of trust, but uh, for many blockchain implementations, it becomes mob rule. Uh, so that that's another security nightmare because the mob is, is not does not exactly does not necessarily do the smartest thing, um, as we have seen yesterday. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut that topic short because we, we don't want to go into politics. Uh, on, on the security aspects in general, I, I like, Paul, that, that you mentioned uh, uh, not, not only system security, but also personal security, like PII. Um, so that's going to be uh, certainly a hot topic. Uh, in, in, you know, it's a hot topic now, and, and it's going to continue being a hot topic. 
on, on the system security side, uh, I find that um, the, the sensible course of action seems to be around mitigation, risk mitigation, and then damage mitigation once uh, an intrusion happens. And uh, I'll, I'll seat the, to the next person who wants to talk now. I'll put my hand up real quick. Um, so I'd say uh, to talk talk about the the topic is to have a discussion about the topic of security. I, I think we have to create kind of a boundary, otherwise it's a little bit too far ranging. I, I assume for you know that we're talking about cloud, that we're talking about infrastructure, uh, not like handsets or uh, somebody's house. Um, some personal, more infrastructure, some type of public type utility that's um, like uh, Amazon or um, a company that's built a hybrid deployment, those kinds of things. If we're talking about that, then um, probably don't have to worry about microphones or video cameras so much because unlikely people are going to be adding those to uh, rackable systems, um, or at least not those kinds of sensors, maybe other kinds of sensors like humidity and, and temperature. But so, but if we're talking about that, then, then things are automatable. Um, so much like any other automation, uh, at a point in time, you can test for certain conditions and why security, uh, looking for code fragments like you would with any other um, uh, antivirus or uh, security penetration software, why wouldn't you do that? Some companies do. Um, it's expensive, but if you're paranoid about security, you do it. Much like you would monitor uh, multiple layers of interior networks for certain types of traffic and inspect packets. Um, look at frames. You know, is it is this bit of information coming across my network? Is it what it's uh, is it what it says it is? The port it's coming across. Is it actually HTTP or is it some some other kind of payload that's trying to infiltrate my network? So um, when you define it that way, then security is at a point in time. It is you can do it. But obviously, uh, from that point in time, uh, somebody else can figure out some security flaw, like what was done through solar winds, and penetrate your network. And then you have to look for new things. Um, so I'll just leave it there. So I'm going to bring uh, uh, an old perspective to the table. A um, uh, long time ago, uh, there was a technique for talking about security called attack trees. Um, and it basically came down to the question is, how much, money are, how much money are you prepared to spend to defend yourself versus how much money your attacker is prepared to spend to attack? Um, and it comes down to, to me, it comes down to an economic question. If security is important to you or your organization, you're gonna do something about it. And you're gonna spend money to do that, right? And if you're if you're an attacker and it's and you want to be good at what you're doing, you're going to spend money to do that. Um, and it comes down to me to a fundamentally to an economic question of whether you know you you know you spend money on what's important to you. Um, and it's that's what I think the driver is going to be there, right? Whether people care, right? If they care, they'll spend money on it. In time. Yeah. Well, spend spend is. You know, you can you can call spend whatever you want, whether you whether it's dollars, time, or you know whatever. But you can define spend any way you want, I guess. Well, Don, it's not it's it's, uh, it's not really an old idea. I mean, you're talking strict, uh, you know, raising of the stakes and on a money spend war. Um, it's it's a very topical concept, risk mitigation within security. Um, you know, you 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 try and categorize what your assets are um, and you have different control points around different assets. It's uh, very few people actually appreciate the financial risk modeling, risk mitigation approach to security, um, but that's not something that died um, a while back. It's, it's very true and present. And because you have this massive sprawl of hardware infrastructure, multi-vendors, APIs, control points that are across uh, how you consume compute in general. Um, that is the only way to kind of approach this intractable uh, of quote unquote security because you know you have all the way from base infrastructure, uh, even in the public cloud, right? I mean, if you're if you're consuming 
somebody else's the, the deepest view you have in compute infrastructure and public cloud gets you perhaps close to well now containers but you know you you don't have anything beyond you you can't view into the os right you can you can install your own on a vm per se but that's that's as low as you can go past that there is this implicit trust of whether whoever your cloud provider is um most of the research that ends up happening in security does not. That's why you need your own infrastructure to actually do that uh, bare bone research. Or you go with a metal uh, infrastructure provider, right? You buy bare metal, um, bare metal compute as a service offering. And then, yes, you can have a deeper view into it. But this is very topical risk mitigation approach uh, to security. That's the way you actually manage it. Uh, it's, it's a huge, huge sprawl of a problem. I have a question for the group. Um, so Sean Roberts was mentioning something very important that basically talking about personally identifiable information and how basically we, we talk about cloud security, but almost always people conflate that with a lot of the other types of security, personal information security, the other types of security. And what I find very, the, where there's a common out, commonality is that there's ways to identify personal information, have personal identify identities, computer identities, and it's, are they similar or different? And basically, is there a way to um, look at that as a similar approach? Basically, zero trust doesn't necessarily approaches look at identities maybe the same way, personal and computer identities. Is this something that a common approach that we could look at going forward? Yes, we actually do. Presently, we already do this, right? So non-user user identities have been a case, trusted system, you know, getting uh, validation, getting authentication from a non-user, that has been a place. Secrets management, this entire realm of, um, it's, it's a very real thing, which lets you manage personal identity versus system identity, system authentication identity, the whole quote unquote supply chain, if you can, that can all be kind of enveloped in this notion of secrets managers. Um, mainstream uh, application service providers do this, um, right? Vault is uh, from Hashi, it does exactly this. It takes this holistic approach to identities, uh, whether they are user identities, whether they're system identities, and builds an entire consuming chain around secrets management. So it exists, uh, it, it's, it's not, you know, do we have to invent a wheel for this? Um, it's, it's here, it was here a couple decades ago as well. So I have, I have a question along these lines um, and I kind of, this is Tim Crawford with Avoa. And so I, I go back to one of the earlier comments too, which was if, if security is important then people would invest in it, um, I guess my concern is that, you know, from a practitioner side of the perspective, it's not all or nothing. Um, it's not a matter of if it's important, then will you invest in it? Yes, I invest in it. But it's a matter of the value I get from it or the risk that I'm able to mitigate from it. It's not the extremes. But then the other piece to that is how do you start to, how do you start to kind of manage that over time from a mindset perspective. And so the, the piece that I would uh, pose to the group is, is the challenge that the technology is not there, meaning the tools don't exist, or is the challenge that people just haven't implemented them or haven't used them in an appropriate way? And so I would argue or launch the position of it's the latter that we have plenty of tools that exist today, but they're either not being used in an appropriate manner or not being used at the level that maybe they should. And so maybe the focus should be there. And I think a, a simplistic example of this, overly simplistic example of this is password management. So I'll just lobby that in and see so, where it goes. So Tim, Tim that's, that's actually a very good segue to several things. Um, we had a discussion about this yesterday, and I know going back to Don, like you say, this is this is nothing new. You know, I worked at big companies, HP, 20 years ago. Security was a big thing. 
obviously nothing different than today, just more sophisticated. But the, the challenge I think still exists is that people think about security after the fact, rather than yes. day zero, implement the security. So one of the things that we do as, as a company is security is thought of at day zero from an automation perspective of cloud provisioning. So that security model is already in place in multiple areas and it's always in code. So everything could be modified or, you know, adjusted right. and tracked and things like that. So, so Tim, that was excellent for where I was trying to kind of set my kind of where I wanted to jump in. So let's throw <laughs> that out there as well. But Larry, so, Larry, this is, this is kind of where I'm, where I'm going with this is the yeah. challenge that the tools don't exist. Take cloud as an right. example that the tools don't exist in cloud today, or is the issue that we're not thinking of, we're not approaching right. risk and security and how we implement the tools. And that is actually the, the core issue. I completely agree with you. Thinking of security as part of your DNA, as yeah. opposed to a project or an afterthought is, is a critical issue across the board, cloud and beyond. But um, I do think that it is the latter, and I'd love to hear you know, differing too. opinions on this too. So yep, I agree 100%. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to just bring, circle back to uh, essentially my first job, and that is a military industrial complex. We were dealing with, literally, it was the Cold War, and it was mad, etc. So in the military, the whole command control uh, communications interface, the C cubed I, I don't remember what all the three C's were, uh, that security was always a big uh, integrated thought, everything from physical and beyond communications, control, et cetera. So, I have been out of that world for long enough that I don't know where it's advanced to, but I'm wondering if not in their computer side of thing necessarily, but in the whole warfare aspect, whether security might have some lessons, especially on the larger front as the theaters got more complex, theaters of engagement and whether there might be some security answers that are sitting there that haven't been addressed by the civilian population. I know that, that you know, security right now is much more piecemeal than cloud is, and we need to get it uh, a more uh, synergistic, more holistic uh, way of connecting all of the tools. So instead of just a bunch of tools, a, a framework as we've done before, and yeah, AI is big there, Rob. <laughs> but uh, is there, are there lessons to be learned from that arena? And, and for that matter, uh, money and low hanging fruit to be attained from there. So can I throw, uh kind of take us back up to the 60,000 foot, or maybe nowadays it's even higher <laughs> atmospheric level, whatever that is, three miles up uh, level. So um, security is, uh, I've always been taught, or I've always uh, was taught and always thought of security as a balancing act between business and security. Um, the most secure system you could possibly have is an air gap system. You know, thinking back to the Cold War, there were some systems that were completely air gapped and anybody that accessed them had to go through um, heavy duty inspection. But even then, people were able to get information, uh, steal information from those air gap systems. Um, then people started focusing on the people uh, to break into the systems. So, um, but obviously not a lot can, business can be done with an air gap system. So even if it's as secure as you could possibly make it, what's the usefulness of it? Um, I was at a lab uh, that I will not name, uh, that, um, that had some air, what they thought were air gap systems. Um, and over time they added, 
um, some uh, the teams that were managing the systems inside the air gap found it uh, difficult to do operations. So they um, added some holes. And before too long, those holes were huge, huge problems because now um, those people, because they wanted to get the work done, were now taking the data that was air gapped home on their laptops. And over a couple of years, the system that was air gapped was the worst secure system in the world because the information was spread out over the entire organization practically. Because, but you know, the, the air gap system was very secure, but the data wasn't. Um, so the the fact of the matter is, security is an, is, is always going to be an evolving thing. Um, the data um, invariably is what you're trying to protect. Um, and unless you're monitoring and you can um, uh, dynamically respond to threats, then your security is only a point in time. It's kind of the point I was trying to make originally, like with solar, the solar winds hack, um, for example, if I was an organization and I found that some of one of my applications on my network was compromised, I could burn the entire system to the ground, destroy it completely operationally. Um, if I had everything ready to do, uh, deployed by CICD, add new security checks to look for that hack and to look for intruders, um, to the best of my ability, rebuild it on the fly, deploy it again. And, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than going through and, and uh, trying to inspect every application on every server by hand, because um, obviously that's not going to be successful. Um, I, I, or, yeah. So anyway, I don't, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I will anyway, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you work in the industry. It's a good intro. It's hard, it's, it's hard for me. <laughs> now it's hard we're for going. Me to, yeah. Well, listen, it's hard for me to listen to this conversation and talk about cybersecurity and not view it as a gigantic racketeering operation that exists between the manufacturers, the programmers, the, the security industry practitioners, software makers that are all um, in it to win it. So the necessity of, or the, the existence of hacks, well, and, and I described the security problem on the internet as twofold. It's compromise and theft, broadly speaking, but the, the broad existence of those events taking place ultimately fund this industry. So I, 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 you know, to me, it's like, I'm Canadian, so take this for what it's worth. It's like the US healthcare system. You're asking, you're asking for, the practitioners of health and the manufacturer of pharmaceuticals to not take a profit first interest in a private system. The, the existence of sick people puts money in pockets. The existence of breach and theft puts money in pockets. This is an architecture problem. This isn't about how much money you spend or you know, the, the, you know, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to protect your network and your systems. This is an architectural problem in the internet. Now, up until now, and this is why I'm particularly interested in the future, because up until now, we've been thought, we've been worried about people's social security numbers and identity theft, and that's not a small thing, it's a big thing, but it's nothing compared to the compromise of a system that controls, for instance, drones, that controls flying taxis, that controls connected and autonomous vehicles, that controls EMS, that controls the electricity grid, that's, and that's why, you know, par putting parlance aside, this is the internet of things, by the way. It's the internet of connected machines that are doing things on an automated basis. It's an architecture. So, sorry. Yeah, it's an architecture problem. So one, one of the things, listening to this, hold, sorry, Lauren, hold on just a second. Is it that, sorry, um, I didn't say, no, yeah, it's hopefully, just, just, hopefully I offended somebody, I tried. <laughs> I, one of the things I'm doing behind the scenes is I, I, I moved the, the, connected, the, the connected internet section to the next section, because I think we're, sure. we're, we're, we're bridging into the holy mackerel, everything's connected together discussion. Sure. Um, well, the, okay, so it's probably, so, you know, generally speaking, it's, I'll call it the centralized nature of cloud and internet is the architectural problem that creates the necessity for the security industry racketeering operation to proliferate. Yeah. There. So I, I had a, you know, one of the things that in putting together this event, and uh, you know, I'm not not adamant on making sure that the the pre-planning matches the execution, but uh, I had thought to help frame the conversation in in sort of these different scenarios. Do people want to 
think through some of the, the scenario components. Like we've laid out a lot of issues and you know, uh, even with the track in the background on AI, ML and things like that, do we wanna frame it in the, you know, what happens with, you know, current, if things are sort of status quo, if things, you know, ex continue to accelerate the way they are, um, you know, and then the completely put things on their head, would that help? Would that help frame the discussion or do people want to? I think, it, Rob, for me, at least, it depends on um, on what perspective we're coming from, uh, because I um, when I'm uh, listening to your your question, I feel like we are um, maybe being asked to solve um, uh, the national security deficit rather than um, whether we put good practices in place for our enterprises. And, and, and those two things, while linked by a basic set of rules and, and opportunities and risks, are very different from a focus and from a true you know, implementation or opportunity to make change standpoint. I, I guess what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm thinking through in this is if, if we don't solve the security problem, I don't think anybody here is saying there isn't a security problem. Um, so if, if we just keep band-aiding it, to me, that's sort of this unchecked growth scenario, status quo, um, you know, well, I don't, and the, the status ahead. quo, the status quo is that security is the gift that keeps on giving. And if you're a rack, <laughs> if you're a racketeer, fine, you know, hey, hands, you, hands up. If you've ever made money consulting a customer on their security architecture. Yeah. Guess what? You're, guess what? You're part of the problem. Well, you are part of the problem, but you also have customers or clients that have a real need. And what you haven't, what I haven't heard is that anybody asking the first order questions, which are what is it that is at risk and what's the nature of that risk? Because it calls for different approaches to security. There is no yeah. one size fits all. And I, I as, as, a, as a way of just starting to draw distinctions, if I'm looking at security in order to deal with revelation, the leakage of information, that's one thing. If I'm dealing with security where I've got to consider denials of service, taking something out of use, those are quite distinct. Those are quite different. And what that says is too often to some of the earlier conversations that, that uh, Tim and Larry brought up, people are trying to find a tool or a set of tools that address everything. And of course it never works that way. And so too often not asking those initial questions, what is it at risk? What is it that you are concerned about? And what's the nature of the risk have to be asked first, at which point you kind of say, fine, do I have the wrong tools or do I have the right tools and I just don't know how to use them correctly? And those are kind of where you start the, start the, the conversation. Um, I, I really want to make sure that we're clear about the fact that there's a big difference between doing a supply chain based, um, you know, build on the back of solar winds, they're, they're gonna be branded forever, you know, as a result of last year. Um, where what you've done is create a listening post and a way of extracting information uh, without detection and absolutely distinguish that from the security you put in place to make certain you've hardened a system on which a society depends. If it's the financial system, if it's the healthcare system, if it's the power distribution grid, 
all of those things are quite distinct. Those are the things that are at risk. There are different sets of risks and therefore different security recipes or formulae that you start with and not drawing that distinction right up front is what I would say is a very, very serious mistake. So Rich, I completely agree with you and, and maybe I should have been just more direct in the interest of time. I was trying to invoke a, a bit of discussion, but I do think we need to understand what the problem is and is the problem technology or is it something else? And I think Larry was kind of jumping on that too. Um, but I would stand by, I don't think the problem is technology and I don't think the solution is necessarily technology. I think the, the solution is actually something that resides outside of technology and how we ultimately use it. So let me just kind of be direct and say that I do think that there is, um, there is guidance that can be provided, cloud and otherwise, when it comes to cybersecurity and how we approach it and how we manage it, how we think about it, not necessarily in that order. Um, and when we start to put that together, then we start to understand which tools are appropriate, where we do need help from a consulting standpoint, kind of to John's point, right? So that the consumer, the customer becomes the driver of it as opposed to an external factor, an external third party in this, which has been part of the problem. I mean, I've paid a boatload of money to security experts over the years and not because I should, but because I had to. Um, and maybe that was a mistake on my part over the years, but today I would take a completely different approach. And I think that's the guidance that we could provide to others. It, it's, not, it's not a mistake and you shouldn't feel bad about that because you're not given a choice, right? Well, there's no, there's well, no other option for you except to, except to pay the racketeer. No, let me, well, let me rephrase that, John, and, and thank you. But let me rephrase it and say that I... I think I made the right decisions with the information that I had at the time and the situations that I was in at the time. Having that all over to do today with the insight and information that I have and the guidance that I could provide to others, I would make completely different decisions. And I think those of us that have led IT organizations um, on this call and beyond would probably say something similar. Yeah, my my observation in that is that it's very difficult to, because I mean I've tried to I've tried to escape you know the the trappings of the cybersecurity economy itself, but unto myself it is almost impossible to do, which is why I think that you know if if there's going to be a change or a a an evo a true evolution in the security of data and and the prevention of compromised systems there needs to be a broader coalition and, and um, dare I say, grassroots movement to, um, to rethink the way in which data and code is protected. Uh, that's not going to happen, uh, <laughs> honestly. Uh, what, if we're talking about the future, looking at the grid, it, status quo is generally gonna happen. There's, Zero trust, some of the secrets management, some, several technologies that are popular and effective are gonna be promoted in the next couple of years. That's gonna be good. Some of the best practices like um, having um, security champions for develop, on development teams, uh, having, a, having a secu someone in charge of security represented on a, on a, board, on a board of directors it will, it will become more common. That's good things. But fundamentally, that's nothing specific is going to change. And maybe it doesn't need to change. Um, I mean, that's basically the, the no question is no, a lot of companies, 10% of the budget is going to security to begin with, literally. Yeah, I, I, I have to tend to agree. You let the good times roll? Is that what we're saying? Because I'll tell me what stocks to buy and I'll get into the racketeering yeah, bit myself. Yeah. John, John, so uh, is it, uh, is it uh, racketeering? So here's the question. Sure it is. Of, hold on. Hold on. Yeah. If, if there's demand uh, for the services and you're providing the demand for the services, you're saying there should be a grassroots movement to change. What's the incentive to change? What I haven't heard is the incentive versus, and everyone's made the argument before, if I'm already spending 10% of my budget towards security, 
what additional value am I bringing if I spend more money? Let's look at the worst. No, you don't want you to spend, no. you spend less on. money. Hold on, hold on. Less hold money. Let's, let, let me get the point through. If we look at the worst, uh, the worst events, Target, uh, Equifax, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, yeah, some, some bad press. But if I had to spend management time in solving a problem, is this the time, not in cost, but in my management's talented time, is this where I want them to spend their time and money versus mm -mm. other opportunities? Eh, I can't I see. I totally agree. Totally agree. Yes. I think, I think, I think the, the purpose of a grassroots movement is to give you your 10% back. But I yeah. think there's a difference between what you're trying to compare in the healthcare industry, which it's been a long time since I was there. Um, but, you know, in the healthcare industry, there's, there's financial incentives for people to bill more, for people to try and control it. But what you're missing the analogy is the fraud in the healthcare industry, right? The people that basically, as soon as you get insurance, basically start dialing out and going, you know, calling for services of the effect of the hackers on it, right? The healthcare system isn't quite as vulnerable to that type of hacking as the rest of the enterprise services are. So I don't think there's a direct correlation there because you're missing that element in the healthcare systems. And I just, the other thing I'd say is I don't think the tools are up to the job. Right. Um, and just as an example, um, it, it, a couple of companies back, I was getting pressure to go buy a CA, right? There were CAs for sale that are trusted throughout most of the browsers for $100,000, right? I, I can buy my way into these security tool networks. And, and to I think Richard's point, right? It, it's kind of like the way you used to treat testing. The amount of security I put in for something that's a game versus something that's a pacemaker is totally different. So you got to understand where you are in the spectrum of your security threat. You need to invest appropriately. So, uh, how, yeah, how, how, yeah, is I, that, how is that different from paying the mobster from keeping your shop from burning down? Oh, oh my God, John! Oh, no, the, wait, no, that's, analogy, that's, the analogy that's, is just, that's just wrong, John. That is just no? wrong. Yeah, no, 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 no. Can I can I bring can I bring one point? And and, and then this I'm going to actually this. to Keith. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, it gets to Keith Townsend's um, <laughs> kind of question. Actually, a number of questions. If we're looking at 2030, there are some assumptions here that we're making about the technology that's being brought to bear that is, I think, at serious risk and is not being invest and is not being considered appropriately. And if you want to look at a major upset, a major transition, it is that for the last Mm, close to 40 years, we've relied on things like um, a form of cryptography for security that is at serious risk. We are looking at quantum computing at 10 years from now at being able to take the approach that we are now using for cryptography and blow through a lot of public key cryptography that's being put in place and has been used. And if you think about that appropriately, you're sitting there going, oh crap, this is, this is not even a Y2K. This is a serious retooling requirement if you have something to protect that's of value to you. So if you wanna talk about 2030 and cloud, and security, let me introduce you to the notion that we are actually able to pretty closely predict a black swan. And it's, let's call it, let's call it a gray swan. It is a, it is a risk that nobody is arguably very few people are attending to right now. And that is a fundamental belief in public key crypto cryptography as it is now done, that is at serious risk. And 10 years from now, there will be tooling that blows it away. So something's gonna have to come in to replace it or we're into a very, very different conversation. Okay. so. I, I want to circle back to, to some of what John said. It's an architecture problem. And part of that is 
all the pieces that go into the architecture. But one of the things we did when I worked for the military industrial complex was that everything was designed before it was implemented. And the risk analysis for security was right up there in your face when you were designing it. It has to be a holistic part of the system. It can't be just tacked on. Tacking it on adds to the cost. People don't believe that, that uh, it costs more to, to buy third-party pieces and build a system out of third-party pieces than it does to design it and then pick your pieces. But it's true, it's the whole digitalization thing. And when you add on both the, uh, the, the whole encryption aspect of it, and it's not just solar winds now, they're now saying jet brains and the exploit was in the IDE. And so everyone who used jet brains may be compromised. So there are different analysis. The risk analysis has to be moved forward and architected into the solution rather than having a team that just addresses it in a production environment. But you know, the, the, the whole notion of the supply chain is is in fact so vital right now. Yes. And this, this is, is actually me... the next the next topic. So I, I want to I want to sort of bridge into. But can I throw one thing in, Rob? Just I'm sorry, because <laughs> Rob, Rob it just hit it. it it's funny because it makes me think of something. You know, the rate of technology change impacts security. I remember sitting in the next open meeting with a general asking if they could add window to window security because they were copying and pasting information from secure windows into non secure windows. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the thing that the thing that all these connect together to me in and, and, is, and the reason I rearranged the order is we are moving into a place where in 2030 and, and you know Rich is right to, to have us keep focusing on where this is going in the future with with that right that's our goal. You can easily see a time when we are so dependent on digital infrastructure in our life that we can't perform basic operations without it, right? We can't get into our house because our doors won't open. We can't start our cars because our, our you know, and security is a part of that, but it's, it's, it's a fundamental component. Um, and so, you know, extending where we, we just were, is this a problem? How do, where does it go? Come and enjoy the next sessions. We start with My Digital Life, which is talking about the accelerating effect of digital uh, into everyday life and that crossover uh, and how we get further and further past the point of being able to survive without Wi-Fi in the cloud and what the consequences are of that. That tees up uh, other great discussions. Uh, enjoy it. Looking forward to hearing from you there.